Verse 8 of 2 Samuel chapter 23. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat, that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, the Esnite. He lifted up his, hand, his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Enlisted in David's army, we find the names of 37 mighty men. They're called the worthies, the mighties, these mighty men of David. We're going to look at one of these tonight and hopefully be inspired by him. The second one, so far as the accomplishments, he was second among the top three, only excelled by Adino. Eliezer, God himself honored these amazing individuals in that he cataloged them by name, not once, but twice, here in Second Samuel 23, and then again in First Chronicles chapter 11. The honor that he placed upon them is amazing, that he would have their record twice in Scripture. But their great honor was to be in the service of one so great as David and that he counted them worthy of serving him and counted them among his worthies or these mighty men. You know, it's not wrong to acknowledge great men of the faith. Church history is filled with them. But it's not wrong to honor them if they are worthy of that respect. And they are worthy if they indeed feel their unworthiness. And I have an idea that those that are truly great, all of them without exception, sense their own unworthiness to be called into the service of the son of David. And of course, we have this great analogy here in David and his mighty men, the Lord Jesus Christ, his greater son, has put together his army, and in this army he also has his own mighty men. But these came to David, these that are now referred to as mighty men, they came to David when his fortunes were at their lowest ebb, when he himself was regarded as an outlaw, when he was held up at the cave of Adullam, as in, in his flight from Saul, who was out to kill him. Things were not looking good for David at that time. But what about these men? What were they like as they came and joined themselves to David there at the cave of Dulem? Well, the scripture tells us that they were those who were in distress. They were those who were in debt. They were those who were discontented. Listen to what the scripture says in 1 Samuel chapter 22. David escaped to the cave of Adullam, and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And every one that was in distress, and every one that it was in debt, and every one that it was discontented, gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. These are the conditions, these are the circumstances under which these that, 
these 37 that are now referred to as his mighty men, many of them came to David at that very time, and that was their circumstances, and that was David's circumstances. But despite their poor circumstances, these were men of honor. These were honorable men, weary of Saul's evil government. They took up David's cause because it was right and because David was a good man and David was the rightful heir to the throne. He was the anointed of the Lord to succeed on the throne. He was being hunted, but he had done nothing wrong. He had done everything actually honorably and right but they knew that David was a good man and they knew that Saul's reign was very oppressive. And so they sought out David and cast in their lot with him. And though this would entail great risk on their part, they would in due time be amply rewarded when their leader would come to honor himself. And that day was surely to come because he was the Lord's anointed. We read in Second or First Chronicles chapter 11, the other account of these mighty men, uh, that these are the men that strengthened themselves with David. So as he was strengthening himself, these men were strengthening themselves and whatever they did in the service of their king, anything that advanced the cause, they were enriching themselves. They were strengthening themselves. And so it is with those that are in the Lord's army. Now in 1 Chronicles 11, we have another register, as I said, of David's mighty men. And this was just after David was anointed king at Hebron. After which David and all Israel gathered to Jerusalem, we're told. Which is Jebus, where the Jebusites dwelt. And David said, whosoever would go up first and smite the Jebusites would be made his chief captain. Now we know that Joab took that challenge. Joab went up first and David did make him captain of his host. It's interesting that among these mighty men, two of them are brothers of Joab. There's Abishai and then there's Asahel. They two, these two brothers of Joab. But Joab was the captain of David's host. Jerusalem, we know, would become the capital city under David. It would be the center for government. It would be the, the center for worship. It would be called the city of David. This city, which is beautiful for situation, will be the capital city and the city of David. And then we read, after we have this account of the taking of Jerusalem and, and Joab uh, attaining unto this high honor of being the captain of David's host, we read, So David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord was with him. These also are the mighty men whom David had. Verses 9 and 10 of First Chronicles chapter 11. Now, this connection... The fact that these two verses are right there together, we're told that David waxed greater and greater for the Lord was with him. And then immediately following that we read, these also are the mighty men whom David had. This connection seems to imply that David's uh, increasing greatness is somehow connected to these amazing warriors and their dedication to David, the way that they fought for him, the way that they served him, the way they risked their lives and did these amazing feats for him. There was a connection between David's becoming greater and greater and the service of these mighty men. I believe that's why that these two verses are joined together this way. God, in bringing these men to David, was providing him with means through which to attain great success. 
Yet it is clearly stated there in the same passage, David waxed greater and greater for the Lord of hosts was with him. That was the reason for his greatness. And yet, there, as I said, it seems to be implied that there's a connection between these mighty men and David's attaining to greatness and becoming greater and greater. His great increase is not ascribed to the host, but to the Lord of hosts. His great success is not owing to his mighty men, but unto the mighty God. But the mighty God gave David this great success in large part through these mighty men. God gave him these men as means, as I said, and they, in their efforts, in their warfare, in their battles as they fought for David, they helped him to become greater and greater. Yet all of the glory goes to the Lord, as is always the case. Now this is analogous to the son of David and his army of faithfuls. First, the worthiness of these worthies was owing to David himself, in large part. And we've already seen what they were when they came to David. They came to him of course, he was at a low ebb himself, but these men were indebted. They were discontented. They, they were troubled men, as, it was though, as though they had nowhere else to turn. We might say, well, what advantage is David going to be to them? What can he do for them? Kind of reminds us of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ when they were called to follow him as he would come to, to Peter and he would come to John and he would say, follow me, and they would leave their nets, they would leave the family business, they would leave their livelihood as Peter uh, re referred to these things later, said we've forsaken all. And as they left these their lives behind and followed the Lord, what advantage was that gonna be? What could he do for them? Why the foxes and the birds of the air had better homes than he had. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He didn't have any money. When it came time to pay his temple tax, he got the money from a fish's mouth. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have money. He didn't have properties. Here he was, the creator in human flesh, had none of these things. But we know what was in it for them to become a follower of the Son of God to become one of his soldiers in his army to fight for him, that was the honor in itself. And these men, as I said before, their greatest honor was just to be in the service of David. They loved him, they admired him. But David himself, in his example and in his teaching, he was able to teach the bow. He was able to teach war. He was a man of war. And he taught them, there's no doubt about it. So his example, his teaching, he's the one that made them what they were. So their worthiness was because of him. It was their love for him that compelled them. It was their love for him that constrained them to do the things that they did. They believed in him and they believed in his cause. And therefore, they risk all. They gave their all because of their love and because of their commitment to him. Now the son of, the son of David specializes in taking to himself the deeply distressed, the hopelessly in debt, the, the restlessly discontent people. He takes them to himself. And he makes them what they are. We know that the Lord said of himself, he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives 
and the opening of the prison house to them that are bound and to comfort them that mourn. That's the kind of people he came to save. That's the kind of people he came to enlist. So these who come to David in distress and discontented in debt, they are a picture of us as the Lord found us, as he found his disciples and enlisted them in his service. But ours is a different kind of warfare. But our Lord's army is also, it also has its mighty ones. Not that they inspire or they aspire to be honored in such a way, but having gone to him, and they have gone to him without the camp. Having gone to him, they've taken fast hold of the word of God. And they refuse to relinquish it. Just like this mighty warrior that we're looking at tonight for our example, Eliezer. His hand claved to the sword. He fought all day long. His hand grew weary. But as he fought hour after hour after hour, alone, his hand literally claved to the sword. That is, we are to hold fast the form of sound words. As we received them from the generation before, as they're handed down to us, we're to take them and we are to hold them fast. We're not to let anything take God's word, our sword, out of our hand. Even though we may grow weary in the battle and there's much to make us weary, we trust that by the grace of God, our hand will cleave to the sword and and never turn it loose. So our example tonight is the second most honorable of David's mighty men, Eliezer, the son of Dodo. From this great warrior, we learn something about individual commitment. And the men of Israel were gone away. The Chronicles account said that the people fled And yet here he is. He stays. He stands fast with his loins gird. He stands with his loins gird about with truth and his sword in his hand. He stays. He does not flee with the others. Our Christian life is one of personal commitment. So we enjoy a blessed fellowship. We are each responsible to Christ as individuals. We sometimes sing that song, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. So we are individuals in the army of the Lord. We enjoy the fellowship of the saints. We cherish it. But bottom line, it's a matter of individual responsibility in our service to the Lord. Many of Eliezer's comrades had let him down. We cannot allow failure on the part of others to weaken our resolve. But many had turned. The people had fled. Eliezer was almost alone. I say almost, I'll explain that a little later. But as far as the fighting men, he was left to himself. Like the children of Ephraim, the psalmist writes about, they turned back in the day of battle. I don't know why some of these fled. If they were just unaware of what was happening or what was going on, we're not told why they left. The people went away. They fled. The Eliezer stayed. Is this the kind of personal conviction and commitment that we have? Well, it's the kind of personal conviction and commitment that God will bless. It's the kind that he uses. Eliezer was not swayed by the majority. 
just because everybody else fled, he didn't say, well, I got to follow the crowd. Everybody's doing it. No, he stayed. He was an individual. He thought and acted for himself. He made the failure of others to be his inspiration. But I said he was not alone. He's mentioned as though he were there by himself. But in both of these accounts, I was interested and I had not noticed this before. I was studying it yesterday and I hadn't noticed it until, the, until reading it this time that Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, he was with David in Pazdamim. And there the Philistines were gathered and they set themselves in the midst of that parcel. He was there with David. And our passage seems to indicate that Maybe the, there were three mighties there besides him, or two besides him and David. But we know this, he was not alone because David was there too. David was with him. And we are never alone. We may think that we're alone. We may think we're the only one. Nobody else is standing. Well, I'll tell you who is standing with us, the son of David. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is standing with us. He's not leaving us. He's not forsaking us. But our responsibility in a certain sense begins and ends with ourselves. Bottom line, true faith is a personal individual matter. Every tub but set on its own bottom. And in a sense, there is no followers, only leaders. Paul said, be you followers of me, even as I am a follower of Christ. But what if we're following Paul and he, does, he stops following Christ? Unthinkable, but what if that would happen? What if you're following the man that is supposed to be leading you and he stops following? Then you follow. You follow Christ. In this sense, we're all leaders and we're to be leaders. And let others follow our example. We know that in the end, this man was a great encouragement to the multitudes because they all returned after he had fend off the Philistines, after he had won the battle, come out of it victorious. Then they all came back to take the spoil. So he was a great encouragement to the whole congregation, to all of the others. But our responsibility is, begins and ends with us in our service to the Lord. We may regret that there are others that are not involved. We may regret that there are others not active in the service. We may regret that there are those who perhaps have great substance and yet as far as the giving, they do none of it. But does this hinder our faithfulness? When we see others that are not faithful, does it hinder our faithfulness? It didn't with Eliezer. Our responsibility is not diminished when others abandon the cause. Quite the contrary. Eliezer must now take it to another level. He must rise above himself. He cannot allow the enemy to be victorious. He would doubtless have welcomed the help of others. Nevertheless, their fainting, it seems, served to strengthen his own resolve, making him more bold than ever. When others compromise the truth, do we lay down our sword? No, we hold it fast. We hold fast the form of sound words. Not too long ago, we studied the latter part of the book of Ephesians. Stand therefore, having your loins gird about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. Stand. 
with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and stand. Yes, from this amazing man, we learn about personal commitment, but we also learn a lesson about personal weakness. How so? He was one of David's mighty men. We see what he did. Yeah, but he wasn't God. He was a man filled with the Spirit, as it were. He was a man of great strength and great courage, but he wasn't invincible. He rose and smote, we see, until, read that, until his hand grew weary. Yes, the mighty Eliezer, second in honor to all of the mighty men, he grew weary. His hand grew weary. Earthen vessels, even the most fit and strong, are subject to weariness, weakness, physical weakness. That's not a sin. Jesus grew weary sat on Jacob's well. He was weary. He was hungry. The journey had been wearisome. He knows our frame. He knows that we're but dust. And he knows that there are limitations to what these bodies can do. Even an Eliezer had his limitations. After eight or ten hours of wielding the sword, and you can imagine the energy that was spent that day. His hand grew weary, and understandably so. We grow weary in body, we grow weary in mind, we grow weary in spirit. The intenseness of the battle wearies us. These factors need not make us weary in spirit, though. Jesus' disciples when they were very weary, it was shameful how weary they were. When they slept, when he told them to stay awake. And he came back and, could you not wait with me one hour? Couldn't you watch one hour? But then he said, your spirit was willing. The flesh is weak. But that seemed not to be the case with Eliezer. His tired body was enabled by the strength of his spirit to go beyond natural ability. He had a spiritual adrenaline, if you will, that just kept going, that would not stop. And we sometimes witness this phenomenon in the natural, on the natural level, the sheer will to win, that will to conquer, that will to endure has propelled many an athlete to victory. It's propelled many a soldier on the battlefield to go beyond what they, you would ever thought they could do or what they thought they could do. Just the, like I said before, that adrenaline flowing. You gotta do it. So they drive themselves. We see this many times with our first responders. While everybody else is running away from the fire, they're running into it. While others are running away from the hail of bullets, they're running toward it. They, they go over and above the, what we would say is the call of duty, though they consider it their duty. But how do they do that? They, they just have this will to conquer, this will to endure, this will to be victorious. May it be so with us in this good fight of faith. May we experience that spiritual adrenaline like Eliezer sets forth here. We learn something else from this man. We learn that God will enable his weary soldiers in their times of weakness. It seems that Paul had been overcome with a sense of his weakness. And we don't know exactly what he was suffering. 
But we know that it was real to him. And the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul was feeling his weakness. He knew his weakness. He was fainting. And the Lord says, My strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. I'll glory in my hand growing weak, says Eliezer. I'll trust in the Lord. The Lord will give me strength. And so his strength is made perfect in weakness, and we always have to claim that promise, don't we? Eliezer, his name means God hath helped, or helped of God. Well, he certainly had help from God this day, because mighty man or no mighty man, he could not do this without God's help any more than Samson could have done the great things that he did, except by the power of God. Now his strength was not in his locks. That was just a symbol of his strength, that he was a Nazarite, he was dedicated to God. His strength came from God. And he could do superhuman things. And so Eliezer and some of these mighty men Adino slew 800 himself alone. Shama stands in a field of lentils and defends it and keeps the enemy from taking it because it was vital. It was the bread of life that they needed and he defended it all alone. And now we have Eliezer here standing, warding off all of this attack by the Philistines. Eliezer had a source of strength that surprised even himself, I believe. His hand grew weary, and yet his hand cleaved to the sword. How did his hand cleave to the sword? If his hand was weary, why didn't the sword fall out of his hand? His hand was weary, but yet it clave. How did it cleave? How did he keep hanging on? Well, we know where our spiritual strength comes from. We know when our hand is weary. We know where we're going to find our strength. Hast thou not heard? Hast thou not known that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, and there's no searching of his understanding? He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no strength, he increases their might. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? that the Lord is not weary, that he never can grow weary, and that he gives power to the faint? He certainly does. So our strength, we know, comes from the Lord. But why did this mighty warrior's hand cleave to the sword? Well, one reason might be the energy with which he gripped it. The soldier's sword was one with himself. And it ought to be that way with us and the Word of God. The Word of God ought to be so much a part of us that we can't lay it down, that we can't release it. And it should become one with us. Evidently, John Bunyan was of the thinking that perhaps, literally, his hand had been glued to that sword, if you will, by the congealed blood of the enemies that he had slain. Because Bunyan in the Pilgrim's Progress speaks of Mr. Valiant for Truth as having his hand glued to the sword by the blood of the enemy. And no doubt in that he is thinking of 
Eliezer, this mighty man. So he pictures him as his hand is weary, but it cleaves to the sword because it's glued by the congealed blood of the enemy. But there becomes an almost involuntary connection of oneness between the Christian soldier and the spirit and the sword of the spirit. Despise not prophesying, Paul said. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. He says to Timothy, hold fast the form of sound words. Don't let them slip. Hand them down to the next generation. But do not release them. This is a good thing. To hold. To have our our hand gripping the Word of God, to have the Word of God gripping us so that we can't separate ourselves from it. Well, time is getting away. There was a couple more things I'll just mention and we'll not, have to, we'll not spend time on them, but we learned that as the battle is the Lord's, so is the victory. The victory is ascribed not to Eliezer here, but to the Lord, you notice. The Lord won a great victory. It was not won without Eliezer, and yet it was not won by him. The Lord can work independently, but ordinarily it is by the sword that he has put into our hand that he wins the battle. By the foolishness of preaching, it pleases God to save them that believe. This assurance encourages us to go, go it alone, if we must. To go it alone, if we must. Listen to uh, this verse of Scripture. It's here in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come and let us go over unto the, this garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Well, the reason is that it's by his strength, it's by his power, it's his victory that is won. And we learn that singular faithfulness can restore courage to the weaker brethren. And the people returned after him. The people returned after him. It's good that we remain strong. It's good that we hold to God's word. It's good that we stay in the fight, even when we're weary, because it will be a great encouragement. It will be a great example to restore courage to those that are weaker.